and people can't shut it down in lane, and then it gets a free ticket to the late game, where, of course, it just does an absurd amount of damage. And specifically in this meta, where backline threat's kind of out the window, you only really think about the teleport flanks from the like of Mal Ma likes of Maokai, when a lot of those tanky top laners that could really get to the backline, like Hecarim, are no longer in the meta. We've seen so many games where Cogmore waddles around a fight, free hitting with auto attacks, and putting out that massive damage capacity that he's always had. Well, my theory about jungle bands is right out the window, oh, Bobby Smithy. Yeah. It is Alistair and Annie. So going after Pure, who has had a more limited champion pool, Victor, banned by Najin. Of course, Najin been emphasizing the twisted fate on Jagoong recently. He has had some good games on TF and Victor, but sometimes struggles outside of that champion pool. And wow. there is a Lucian. Lucian, a big champion. Respect. Pick. You know, we talk about this pick in terms of the fact that it's had a very low win rate in a lot of scenes. OQ completely smashed in the last series against Anarchy in the last two games, was really smashing members. And to get the respect, man, we're talking about the meta changing. What a crazy meta where one small laning buff that really makes that laning that much more regular for the likes of Braum. Now he's in first pick territory. And especially when you ban out two supports, uh, those are two. So let's talk about what they're Engage doing right is now. Gone. Yep, Ku banned out two primary engaged supports. Where does Pure go right now? Uh, the engage is gone, and Watch, I mean, simply isn't the best jungler. When we compare engaged capabilities between Watch and Hojin, Ku's junglers, both Hojin and Wisdom, are very good at engaging, especially with Evelyn. And that's, that's, that's all I think about this, because of course, when you first think of Braum, you think disengage, of course, the ultimate, just in general, the kit built around disengage. The likes of the Ezreal mid has really unlocked Braum's offensive capacity. Every time we see that Q, the Winter's Bite hit, and of course the stun come through, people are dying in this meta with the large amount of poke, with the long range auto attack carries, like the likes of Kogma, who activates Biocane Barrage, gets the Rage passive from the Trinity Force, and gets those three hits off. So very good for disengage, which is what we expect from Q, given they banned all the primary engage but flexible enough to get those picks as well. And look at it, it's going further with that primary engage. So in the first round, they take Janna and Rek'Sai Najin, and Ku responds with the, the Gragas and the Maokai. These are the other primary engage picks right now. And they need damage from those last two picks. It's, it has to be, it's on a silver platter for the first Kog'Maw pick from Prey. Absolutely, uh, Kog'Maw and TF would both be great picks. For Ku, they would have a ton of kill pressure in the side lanes. Now, you've taken Janna. Do you just take away the Kog'Maw if you're Najin? I, I think you take TF Kog'Maw here, because if you don't, okay. They're going on to OQ's Vayne, a, a champion that has won them games, a champion that has earned OQ Oh, bands. boy. And the Yasuo against the Twisted Fate. Last time we saw Kuro play Yasuo, it was at MSI in their best of three loss to WE, it was not impressive. It looked like Ku did not know how to team fight with that champion. Not MSI, because that was back at IEM Katowice. Oh, I IEM, that's Even right. longer ago, and the Yasuo pick from just off the side from the outskirts of Kuro's champion pool. Now, they needed damage with those last two picks. They've certainly got it. It's a good laning matchup, but this is certainly a risky pick for Ku, and one they've already struggled on in previous time. A lot of time to practice since then. But look at the knockup and the synergy they have. Oh Maokai, Gragas, oh and the the, uh, the Braum. They have a lot of synergy with the Yasuo here. And Najin, they don't really have a tank. So Yasuo could absolutely rip through their composition. Duke may try to go for the Fizz counterpick into the Maokai, but frankly, uh, Smeb did very well against Marin's uh, Fizz in this matchup in the laning phase in their matches against SKT. That was actually one of the bright spots, I feel, to those games for the Koo Tigers. And now with that Fizz locked in, they're going to hope that Duke can overtake this game because their only win condition right now is to play pick and to split push in a 1-3-1. One, one. Absolutely, they need Duke to be completely monstering, completely bodying Smeb on this Maokai, because otherwise, Wave clear is not great from Najin, it's just Twisted Fate, who has those low base stats, very diveable by the, by the likes of Gragas, Maokai, and the Yasuo. You know, if you just stand under the turret as Twisted Fate, just throw out the barrel lazily, that's already an instant knockup for the last breath from Kuro. Can Kuro play this Twisted Fate at a top competitive level? That's still a question mark, though. 
Monte Cristo as he really needs to perform this game. But Prey, first time for the Kog'Maw, and you couldn't have picked a much better comp for it. I think Kog'Maw Braum is one of the strongest lanes in the game right now. Should have an advantage, and this presents a really troubling situation for Najin. You do not want to be in the Kog Braum lane if you are Vayne Janna, but you need the, the Fizz to be in the Maokai lane for Najin. Najin, we're looking at two diametrically opposed compositions. Najin needs to split push, they need to play pick. But if Ku gets rolling in a 5v5 team comp, they have all of the engage. Najin has none. They do not have tools to get onto the back line. So Najin, playing to their strengths, need to win the laning phase. Let's see if they can do it. Let's get into game one. Game one here between Najini Empire and the Ku Tigers. I love games like this, Papa Smithy. I love when we see team compositions that have such different goals. Yeah, they both have distinct win conditions. They're not fighting for the same things. Really. As you mentioned, split push versus group. It's objective focus versus side wave pushing. And on a rainy day in Seoul, where maybe your spirits are a bit lowered, I'm hoping for <laughs> Ku and Najin to really boast it up as my parents are on the screen. <laughs> That's right. I was with these parents. Coming here from Abu Dhabi, long trip by Australia, London, and all the wonderful places. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, Ku getting some deep wards in early. We'll see if they opt for this lane swap, although Najin can get kind of cocky with this vein pick, We're thinking talking. that they have that advantage regardless of the preference of matchups. There's a lot to invade for, both matchups and, of course, the saplings being protected that Smeb's put down. You know, you mentioned Najin really want to get Fizz ahead. I mean, Gragas and Ku in general are going to be aware of just how bad this matchup is. We've seen so much play around this Maokai versus Fizz matchup. Which jungle is going to be more on point? You have to kind of put the first bet towards Hojin, but he does have less competitive experience this season than what Shu. Hot and cold, that's kind of been his career story. Yeah, that is true. And especially because we know how this matchup goes when the Ku Tigers play it. We see a lot of Maokais bowled over by the Fizz pick, but uh, over the last few matches, it wasn't only versus SKT, but prior to that, Ku has been unafraid of playing into this. Is that foolish? Perhaps, might be a little bit on the foolish side, but in in a way they've made it work and they gank for the Maokai quite frequently to help out. And Kuro, this is a pick that, seeing this makes me very nervous, but perhaps the Ku Tigers have solidified their play around this and will be doing a better job of synchronizing the Yasuo ult than they did all the way back at IEM because those team fights were a mess. That was back in March. It was in a meta when, of course, Ku were famous for their late game team fights and still they were not able to put it together for the Yasuo. So we'll have to see whether the Yasuo pick has been practiced. Very confidently locked in. So you have to think pre-planned for this game. Yeah, I think absolutely. They came in here thinking that if the TF goes, I think that basically their, their thought process was, we're going to take TF, and if you take TF, this is how we're going to respond to it. Of course, they'll be able to block a lot of TF's abilities with that wind wall, so certainly a pretty nice upside. And champions like Kog'Maw and Braum, TF, that are really shaping them. These are champions that have very high win rates. Braum, of course, not the big sample size just yet, so can't really talk about whether it's a maximum pick, but Twisted Fate and Kog'Maw are the two highest win rate champions in champions this season. Well, whenever the assassins get nerfed, Twisted Fate rises, you can't really argue with his buff, and here comes Hojin looking for a gank. Nice tornado from Pure going to shut that down. And Duke going to playable Trickster and Watch coming in, but Watch is quite low. Watch is level three, Hojin only level two. There's the knockup onto Gorilla. Gorilla level two, can he get out? Has to use that flash. And they're trying to turn this around, but the Winter's Bite will miss. And now a melee support without flash means that Ku are gonna have to play so much more defense in the top lane. We expect that Fizz will be able to pick up that much more free CS, not having to worry about Gorilla harassing him. And Gorilla, honestly, Probably going to follow his usual playstyle. He doesn't want to stay in this lane any longer than he has to. This guy is one of the best roaming supports in Champions. Yeah, and it, it also affects... We talk about how Prey has sort of a substandard laning phase, but a lot of that 
uh, is how the Koo Tigers like to play. We look at Gorilla, he's actually number two in kill contribution in the league, only behind Chaser. So he just makes so many early plays on the map for Kuro and Smeb to get them ahead that sometimes Prey isn't really able to CS as well as some of these other AD carries because he just doesn't have that same level of help in the lane itself. And that was the notable thing that we talked about during the SKT versus Koo series, that despite doing all this winning, despite Koo having that big run, Prey is negative in goal, uh, CS uh, at 10 minutes compared to his opponent. He's always behind in gold compared to his opponent, just because, as you mentioned, Gorilla loves to pack up and leave his Kuro. That's stunned, but opens up enough distance to get away safely. Yeah, watch. Not really going to commit to that, especially with the pick-a-card on cooldown from Goong. Goong having trouble in this laning phase. It is very difficult to trade with a lane bully like Yasuo, who has that shield in the wind wall to shut down a lot of your damage. Still a lot of pressure on to mid, targeted stun, and of course, the big CC that can come through from the unburrow. But every time he pulls anything other than a gold card, gets harassed out of lane. Well, Watch doing a good job of playing around Hojin right now, stuffing several of his gangs, staying up. He's 18 to seven in terms of CS right now, so been doing a much better job of farming and getting those levels in early, Hojin lagging behind. Let's talk about the lane top that's occurred, because of course we do have a Maokai versus Vayne bottom lane matchup. This helps Vayne pick up the experience, because not a wonderful laning matchup. Vayne are not known for their 2v2 laning. If Vayne can pick up that uninterrupted farm, pick up the Blade of the Ruin King, there is significant outplay potential onto a Cogmore if we do see the resulting 2v2 matchup later on. Well, it, it has to come down to that split pushing, though. And, you know, Papa, I'm just not sold on split pushing in the current meta. It's just too hard to win the game with a split push. Because eventually, if you could crack the base by yourself, that's one thing. But it's so hard to get an inhibitor or an inhibitor turret all by your lonesome. And eventually, you're going to have to actually fight for a fifth dragon or a baron. And if you don't have a large, large gold lead with a split pushing composition, because these champions are designed to be split pushers, they're not designed to be team fighters. And that can create a lot of problems because you're unlikely to ever get that gold lead. And the game state was changed with the advent, with the uh, introduction of the stacking mechanic around Dragon, which meant that team fights you had to opt into them more and more. Gone were the days of the CLG you stole from about 20 minutes into the game. One factor to consider, though, is that of course on either this patch or the last one, finally the slow was removed this from one. those inhibitor ties. This patch. So oh no, suddenly, the last one. The last one. So suddenly, yeah. split pushing. Okay, it's still hard. Okay, you're still not guaranteed to break that inhibitor turret, but it's better. So there is still slight hope if you're Nargen. I also think that Elixir of Ruin is a very underutilized item if you're going to commit to split pushing. But those are my own feelings. I'd love to see more of that from dedicated split pushers an option that we'll see. Uh, the laning phase has been very quiet and in general, not much has happened this game. If we look at the CS, you know, the only big advantage is in the lane counter pick matchup. Yasuo fairly comfortably ahead of Twisted Fate. Indeed, so Hojin here, sussing out this pink ward. He wants to get some pressure onto the blue buff. Goong just going to wrap around the opposite side and blue card it. And then auto attack it, and then auto attack it. <laughs> for the pickup. Hojin playing a little bit dangerously. Oh, They're gonna go for it. Hojin coming in right there, but they don't follow up with the last breath off of the knockup. He didn't hit a knockup that time. I yep. believe he just airballed it completely. So they have to back away. Now, Twisted Fate hasn't been able to pull blue cards because he gets all in by Crow every time he needs to. So blue buff control was that much more important for Najin. It's so important they secure this second blue buff. I expect a big contest by Ku come third blue. We'll have to wait and see if that goes through. In the meantime, Sheen picked up from Prey on the bottom side. Can he actually do some work, slow down OQ's vein with that massive range advantage? And Smeb going after Red. Oh, it could be a big collapse right here. Watch is not seeing anything yet. Now he knows what's going on. There's the destiny. They have three. It's going to be a three versus three if they go in. 
Typhoon looks like there's a nice knockout from Watch as he comes through. Windwall going to block the fish. Fish still going to hit some people. Watch goes down first. And now Duke targeted out right here. Smep has that red. There's the flash arcade smash. Goog trying to get a gold card onto Kuro. That's not going to work. Kuro flashes away. He will sidestep the wild cards. And there is no more damage. OQ and Pure are up here for some reason. Gorilla not level six yet, so he's going to use that unbreakable just to help his team get out. And will OQ go forward? Exhaust onto OQ right now. They may want to keep fighting this. Kuro does not have his ultimate. They're going to have to sacrifice Smeb to OQ. And there's another flash from Gorilla. Oh. Long skirmish. Windwall comes up at the last second. So it will be a two for one trade in the end in favor of the Ku Tigers. OQ eventually gets the red buff. But the crazy thing is that remember, they actually committed walking all the way from bottom layer there, Najin, to fight in a fight on the top side of the river. So many resources used just to pick up effectively a red buff and a poor kill trade, you know, one for two. Najin really have to snowball this bottom lane because Kog'Maw got a free shop, had the lane in the place he wanted to. Okay, you're gonna have to kind of hang back. You're not gonna really be able to trade for the next two minutes or so, but it's a lot invested just for that payoff of the red buff on OQ. Yeah, and Kuro with a very early static shift now on Yasuo, 10 minutes, not a normal timing. You see that item usually comes about three minutes later. Meantime, Smeb gets a kill gets an assist, and he's ahead of this Fizz now. They need the Fizz to win this lane. And they've committed so much for a negative trade. So look, Vayne getting going is one thing, but if Maokai can just control the, the Fizz state an item or half an item ahead of Fizz, their game plan's kind of out the window. Yeah, it does fall apart very quickly. And Kuro is going to be slashing through these minions. Goon still has to play very reserved, has a sheen now for some extra damage alongside those boots of lucidity. I don't know if I would have actually finished that sheen or gone for some home guard boots at this point in the game. We've seen definitely the regular 1500 gold investment into the home guards just to stay in lane. Because if you lose your turret at Twi as Twisted Fate, you have such a hard time strategically as a team. And look at the turret health. It's chipped down. It's at 30% or less. Watch has to spend a lot of time around mid, but Goon, it's not much he can do. Nope, not much at all. And now Duke and Smeb going head to head here. Smeb easily able to hold on at the very least in that trade in spite of the sheen. He's got a little bit of armor now. Some nice sustain with that catalyst. So OQ trying to make some plays here. Gets a nice chunk out of Gorilla on the bottom side. So Ku still having some trouble with this Vayne and Janna combo in spite of their what would we would assume is a big advantage. Hojin and Kuro maybe looking for a dive right here. They're going to get into the enemy jungle. And Ajin does not know this is happening. OQ trying to back off right now. Hojin coming back from the turret. There's the explosive cast. OQ immediately gets hit by the last breath. TP coming in from Goong. But there's a nice double shield coming through and a beautiful double from Kuro under the tower. And um, what do you do against Windwall and Unbreakable if you're Twisted Fate? They're going to be blocking Fizz Fishes too. It is a massive problem. I wasn't able to see if the Destiny was on cooldown or not, but they pinged sort of defensively. They didn't have any ward coverage whatsoever over the river area. Still very surprising that Gragas and Yasuo could saunter over to bottom lane and cause that engage, but the moment you throw out explosive cars, multiple members of Najin were always going to die. Yeah, OQ just took a boatload of damage right there. And that's the double to Kuro. Getting that Yasuo fed is a big problem, and he's building Phage. Okay, so this is something you might not have seen, but Trinity Force Yasuo is starting to become a thing. Of course, your Q applies the on-hit effect, so you can do surprising bursts, especially if you get the crit off. And of course, with the changes to the Static Shiv and Infinity Edge crit, you kind of started to get to weird crit values. I think we're going to be seeing a very expensive build come through, but man, does it do damage. All right, Gorilla gets knocked up by Watch. Kuro going to respond. Watch has to dodge around from those tornadoes coming out from the Yasuo. And, you know, we've seen a lot of Trinity Force Yasuos in the past, sure. but not usually as a second item. And that's the big change here. It's starting to get a little bit of popularity over Infinity Edge. Very same cost, but you space out those queues in particular, and of course you're auto-attacking and queuing on such a short cooldown throughout fights, it can really pay off. Makes you a turret destroyer as well. And speaking of turrets being destroyed, I mean, this is all Goon can do. He kept those blue buffs. They haven't been able to contest that objective, but he loses his turret. Yeah, he does. And this is a big change from the Ku Tigers that we saw go up against SKT, because remember in those games, 
they were playing uh, with Cassidy and Cassiopeia and Kuro, a big problem in those games was how fast his mid turret was going down to Faker. This time they pick a lane bully, they try and go for that winning matchup, so they have control and Kuro immediately just waltzes into the top side and that's another turret down. We've now stretched this to over 3,000 gold advantage at 14 minutes. Ku in complete control of this game. And this is a disaster for Najin. If they can't wrestle out some sort of edge in a lane, their split push is never going to get going and they are going to get destroyed. And it's the thing is their four-man unit, when Fizz is split away, it's not super strong. It certainly can't outmatch what Ku is able to put together. And there may even be a scenario where Trinity for Static Shiv uh, Yasuo can just go into these sideways and deal with the Fizz. It used to be a counter matchup when it was AP Fizz versus Yasuo, but when we're talking about these item timings from Ku, as oh. watch, just casually smites away the red oh. duck. Explosive cast. Yeah, misses the explosive cast. Meb's still here on the teleport, but they're not going to get over anywhere unless Meb really wanted to flash for that, which he does not. Anyway, it's super pushed into top. Not a lot of wave clear from Fizz, so first strang in the game. It's late, but looks like it's coming for the Ku Tiger. Yeah. This, uh, this Gragas from Hojin has been a little bit underwhelming. I look at the Ku Tigers, and I look at Hojin, and he's in the right places. This is the, the perplexing thing about the Ku Tigers. They will do the right thing, but they will botch the execution in some way. It's just not quite perfect. And right there, Wisdom definitely the better uh, Gragas player By between far. the two Ku junglers. But a couple missed abilities, missed skill shots in this game have cost them kills. So far he's missed a body slam that would have led to a last breath. And then just explosive cast has a pretty big range of effect. Missing that skill shot as well. Okay, Hojin, you still got the game ahead of you, but you really need to work on the mechanics for the Gragas. <laughs> He's also a 100% kill contribution rate, and he's been in the right places, even if he didn't get the kill right there. Because of the TP from Smeb, they could immediately transition into the Dragon. So, again, the timings are great for Ku. The shot calling is there, we know that. But it's these micro mistakes that they make, or a, a lack of a ward here or there on their flank that opens them up to counterplay that really shouldn't exist. My big question to you, Monte Cristo, so 40% crit critical strike is what you get from the static shift. You get 20% from the Trinity Force. Of course, logically, 100% comes through from Infidia. You don't need to take any crit runes. Can he really afford to go a super expensive build, or does he go defensive item after the Trinity Force? I think you just go for it, because if you look at Dajin, as we see the gate coming in here, oh my goon just poured it into his own demise. Oh my goon. Oh my goon. Uh, it looks like he may have been trying to make a play onto the top side. I don't know if he actually ported right there, but definitely uh, got caught in the end. And Kuro, with that amount of damage right now, cannot be ignored. Ku Tigers, winning lane, winning game, picking up the objectives. And we're still not talking about the Maokai being out pressured by the Fizz. In fact, 20 CFs quite, up quite comfortably, even though the game hasn't really been played around this lane at all. No. No, it has not, but the lane swap really went well for the Tigers. Smeb got a bit of a level advantage from that 1v1 as opposed to the 2v2. Kuro just slicing his way to another tower. Smeb responsible for chasing Watch around. There's a knockup again. Watch is there, but he's just going to get bodied as Smeb pops his ult. Goon trying to make a play right now. Duke on the side, but Gorilla is there to help out with some backup, and Kuro had his last breath up again, so dangerous to re-engage. And Ghost was used by Goon to try and get those future gold cuts, but he didn't have OQ pressuring the mid lane. Might have been just going into his doom, so they back away. Remember, Maokai got solo experience, so did OQ, but we haven't been talking about Vayne trying to body out the Kog'Maw or dueling at all, despite he being the one that really won the early game rotational play for Najin. No, this is a, just a disaster, and this is what can happen if Najin falls behind when they choose to run a composition like this. You just lose all pressure. You will get dove because you have no tanks right now. Duke will be building into some tanky items eventually, but he's nowhere close at the moment. And Yasuo saunters around, 420 move speed, 420 blaze. It seems to be the strategy from Koro, and this is a redemption game for him. All He's right. really performing as OQ looks to re-engage with a double exhaust. Smeb is here. He's on the backside. There's the Monsoon going down. We will see the gate and the Destiny watch on the bottom side of the map. Long range, twisted advance. On to Pure. TP's coming through. And Prey in the middle right now. Duke on top of Gorilla and Prey. Prey actually just going to kite this one out. And there's the big knockback. And here comes Yasuo. Flashing forward onto OQ. Will miss his Steel Tempest, but it's enough from Hojin, he gets another double. And that setup 
Koo, so smart. They know they don't have TP advantage. Smeb just waiting in the fog of war to make a play, and they are able to answer in a 5v5 on the bottom side just by getting there sooner. They outplayed two globals from Najin in that fight with a great setup in the bottom lane. And honestly, Goon was gun shy. He actually activated the Destiny quite, quite late, and you saw the power, as we're going to see in this replay of the Trinity Force Yasuo coming through. It makes your Q just do so much more damage because of applying that on-hit effect. So Destiny's been used, not committed to it just yet. One teleport being channeled. We're going to see the Destiny come in. Gorilla really smart with his positioning, blocking damage. And now it's time for Yasuo. Yeah, very nice unbreakable right Whoa. there. And look at the three-man ult. Everyone just explodes. And each Q's doing over 300 damage. You can't kite him because he has 420 movement speed. And he has, of course, the ability to continue to dash on a very short cooldown. The redemption story from Kuro, it's almost completely written. 4-0 and 6, 100% kill participation for the Yasuo. That's right. And the long sword here, the next item. So he's going to Jaws keep... theme. Goodbye, Bray. <laughs> I mean, not Jim, they have to make these picks. That's how they have to play the other It's just like, I got caught. Grit on his face. Didn't need to be there at all. Got caught, as you mentioned, with his pants down. They're going to keep pushing top lane. And OQ, as has been the story of this game, most it's the large non-factor. It's completely on the other side of the map. Well, they have to keep split pushing right now. If they want to get back into this game whatsoever, they only have a very small chance of making this into a competitive match at this point with this level of gold deficit. And the fact that the Ku Tigers are going to be able to bait this Baron basically forever and force fights until the end of the game. And look, I'm usually the voice of reason. I'm usually the one of the optimistic part of our duo, Monte Cristo, but the item timings for Smeb versus Fizz cannot be denied. Frozen Heart and the Righteous Glory for team fights compared to just a Trinity Force. There's no chopping down this tree. No, there's not. And here we go, 20 minute Baron from the Ku Tigers. Perfect call right now. They want to force this fight. Gorilla going to get into the pit right there. And will Dodgen actually commit to this? They sort of have to. Smep going to recall right now. He's going to have that full HP on a teleport if they decide to go in on this. Watch still hovering on the outside. Duke there too. Prey finally joining the mix. And here comes the Destiny. Baron getting very low. Here it goes. Who's going to get it? It will be Hojin. Watch is just going to get melted into the pit. Goon trying to control the choke point. They get the fish onto Gorilla. Pure has to deal with Kuro. Kuro just slicing his way to a victory. There is a stun from the concussive blows. And that is it. Kuro helps Prey get another kill. Goon still running around in enemy territory right now, but he's going to get delayed. And this Baron. They're just going to be able to push right through to an inhibitor. There is no wave clear from Najin. It's only Twisted Fate. He's just going for a lazily walk on the enemy side of the base. He's going to die. Trinity Force Yasuo with the static shift. 420 movement speed outside of combat. You hit a Q. The Rage passive is a melee champion. 440 movement speed. Has those resets on the dash. There's just no way to kite out the damage, and that's why he's overtaken this game. Yeah, it's been absolute dominance from the Ku Tigers. They couldn't take the inhibitor, spawn timers were too close. Let's take a look at this Baron fight again. So this worrying thing for Ku is they actually gave Najin a way back into this game. Both the junglers were level 11. It ended up being basically a smite war. It was won by Ku, and then the resulting team fight was only ever gonna go one way, because that's not what Najin picked for. They didn't pick for team fights. That's why Ku was like, let's just keep doing this Baron, because even if it's smited away, we will win the resulting skirmish. Yeah, I think that's the key right there, is they actually didn't care whether or not they got the Baron, because they killed nearly everyone on the team. The Baron would not have saved Dodgen whatsoever. So you're either going to win the game completely from taking the Baron, or you're going to be in that position where you're still ahead in gold, despite maybe a single Baron buff being worn on Dodgen. So look, you always think about that prisoner dilemma. What am I going to trade for? What am I going to get out of this risk? And the risk was only ever going to go one way for the Ku Tigers. Yeah, I think that was an excellent Baron call from them, and now... No way of clear fizz, what you gonna do? <laughs> Watch sadly as they murder your towers. I mean murders, again, Kuro. Trinity Force Yasuo, it's coming to a theater near you. Six, zero, and seven on this Yasuo pickup. And now Najin, they just, they can't defend. They cannot fight 5v5, they can't do anything against this. They have lost because they lost the laning phase and their composition has no answers to a Baron up Ku comp. They're basically 
just watching a nature documentary on how to, you know, rule the animal kingdom. They're, <laughs> they're learning about lions so far, and the Koo Tiger, five lions in this lineup, none bigger than Koroas. Whatever, turret doesn't matter. He's just gonna go on a merry goon chase right now. Everyone just waltzing through, and they force the destiny out. Goong trying to delay the minion wave, but there's still one there right at the tower. That's going to be enough just to take it out. Prey just auto-attacking freely from the back line. And look, Najin dropped themselves into this corner, but credit to Koo, those last two picks, one of them expected as Oku's gonna explode. Not quite, there's an exhaust on Akuro, he's getting low, can OQ take him out, he will finally fall to watch, but Prey is just untouched in this battle, and he is going to clean this up, no doubt. Goom trying to get in there, Gorilla still playing for that front line, can Najin hold on, they are getting close here, and looks like Koo will back away as Najin heads back to the fountain, doesn't really matter, they lost two for one though, they still have those double inhibitors down, and. There's nothing at all right now for Najin to take in response. They lost two inhibitors, as you mentioned. There's no dragons, there's no barons, there's nothing apart from picking up more farm. And you're farming and farming to a state that's always still going to be a superior team fight comp from Ku. So it's narrow glory, unfortunately, for Najin. But this is all they can do is try and push up these waves and find a way to force this split push that they picked for in the early game. It's too late. I mean, yep. they, can't, they can't even split push any longer because they're so weak in comparison to the Koo Tigers with this 11,000 gold lead that even if their champions are supposed to win, it's tilted so far in terms of itemization that what? nothing's going to be stopping Kuro's Yasuo at this stage of the game going for a Bloodthirster as his next item. So S chewing some of that crit of course but just going or the big crit with the infinity edge rather and going for the shield and the sustain instead i think you have to go offensive if you're crow and that sounds like a misnomer but basically what i'm saying is he has such low base stats in fact we see a lot of yasuo's uh, gbm include just throw in a giant spell because his base health is so so low that you might be tempted to go for the health but because he's putting out so much consistent damage, because he can't be kited from the build he's gone with the Trinity Force, the overshield and the sustain will probably do more than throwing in any sort of defensive assistance. Well, also, he just has to get one ult, and it's so easy with how many knockups are on the Ku's composition. He, one ult is all he needs. He can die after that, no problem. So we're waiting for this. Is the last inhibitor going down. The engage comes in, and Duke, he's dead. Yes, he is. Agrell pushing forward with the Unbreakable right now, Prey. Gets that last inhibitor, and now they're going to chain the super minion straight into the turrets. No way for Najin to break this siege. They are going to lose this game in 26 and a half minutes right now as Ku just destroys them on the map and plays this composition extremely well. Najin's the one with more on the line. Watch is going to fall down. They're just looking for kills to pad their kill stats. None more than Kuro. This is definitely retribution for him as pure. About to get popped. Nope, lives. <laughs> lives thanks to the Nexus exploding. So that will be game one in a very decisive sub 27 minute match for the Koot Tigers. I came in with a plan this time. They eliminated all of the primary engage from Najin systematically. Ban Alistair, ban Annie. Their first three picks were Braum, Gragas, Maokai. It left Najin with no way to get onto the enemy team. They decided to go for a split push comp and that was it. Najin not looking too broken up, smiles on Duke and Watch. And just from a pick ban perspective, ban away all the primary engage. Get the strongest three champions when we talk about both backline threat and of course Peel, lock in the highest damage AD carry. Into game two, Najin on the blue side, Ku on the red side. How do you ban out both the meta and Ku's power picks? That's the question. It feels like Najin feel obliged to ban Kuro's victor. Of course, still undefeated on that champion. No longer the case for Faker, as he lost yesterday. But the big factor to consider, Monte Cristo, is if you're banning away the victor, a lot's gonna slip through the draft for both sides of this, this game. Yeah, it is. Uh, although, you still have some of that luxury. The Annie on the red side, mm. I find very interesting. Of course, it was banned from the blue side of that last game, but Callista, Rise still going to be available, but Najin actually going to be banning the Rise. You feel like maybe Callista will start slipping through, not OQ. OQ is one no. of the best <laughs> Callistas in the world, so he is not someone who picked it up, but you can kind of see it start just coming through the pick and ban. Still really a first round pick, people prioritizing both the damage she can put out, but also the utility that, that AD carry brings. 
So where do you go here? Alistair was an important band in the first game. The Lucian was something they were afraid of in terms of the strength of OQ's laning phase. And thinking long and hard about this one. They can get the Alistar, so yeah, I think the Lucian ban is smarter because you assume that Najin's going to pick Gragas. And Kog'Maw is also a consideration. Maokai's banned away, suddenly backline threat is kind of absent. You have to feel like it's going to be a first round pick on one side of the Joss, but okay, Watch is going to take the Rex side. The Evelyn hasn't been working out for Watch. And the last matchup couldn't really get much done, so it goes for the Rex side. A lot of potential pressure being put out, but you sacrifice at least the Braum over to Ku. And look, Braum is now higher considered than the Alistair. Yep. And I think that is just generally where we're going these days, especially before the Runeglaive nerfs, because that is one of the main things that's brought Braum into such a high priority, is that it shuts down potential Runeglaive Ezreal picks and makes your opponents very scared that you're going to pick it too. Remember, the Runeglaive Ezreal fell all the way through the draft in the last game. It may come through here, Rumble in the top side for Smeb. With Maokai banned away, Maokai traditionally a lane winning matchup. You do 10 or 20 CS is usually the advantage you get as the Maokai. With Maokai banned away, suddenly not that many reliable ways to deal with the Rumble. Of course, it's patch 5.13 and Leandri's in particular. In general, the core items for a Rumble have been buffed, so He's now really gone up the priority. It's always been up there, at least this season, but nothing changes as Alistair and Siva, strong 2v2 lane taken by Najin. Yeah, no surprise there, right? You have the Alistair pickup. Pierce played a lot of it this season. Now, if you're Najin, you actually have a form of primary engage like they did in the last game. Gragas and Corky, to the surprise of none, will get locked in for the Koo Tigers. They're going for a very standard Koo mid-game power spike team composition, but you have to be very afraid. This is a big setup for Runeglaive as. Uh, Kuro loves playing poke champions. He has a lot of leeway with that. How are they going to deal with the possibility of a Runeglaive as real here? Uh, they don't have the Maokai. They banned it themselves. They have an Azir. That's going to be pretty good in the laning phase, but not that great late. Olaf will be the draft for Duke in the top side as he swaps to Smite. The Maokai no longer available. Olaf is the take. Look, this is a great champion running into the back line to a very squishy back line that we expected from Ku. They see the Olaf and suddenly not really incentivized to go for the APS, or they might actually go for the Lulu and go for one of these uh, basically monopolize objectives or lose comps. Yeah, this is going to be very difficult for them to play. I think the Jace may be a little bit stronger here, so they have some more poke. Uh, we have only seen one game since Jace was changed, and it was a loss by Coco and CJ. Lulu doesn't make a lot of sense here because you will have no damage in the late game with the Koo Tigers composition. And one single damage type, Corky and Rumble, of course, are uh, other big threats, so you kind of need some source of true physical damage. So Jace does loom as the, as the pick, is locked in, as you mentioned. We have to remember, of course, kind of temper that loss. It was CJ with the goon squad. It wasn't with their strongest lineup, so Coco was kind of playing a lone hand this game. Jace has that massive power strike around the time he finishes the Mana Moon and a bit of armor penetration. That's when the burst really sticks, but in the late game, specifically when Olaf can start getting really tanky, the, the poke falls away, and it feels like you have to take advantage of that mid-game window here, Koo, or you're just outclassed in the late game. Yeah, could be very problematic indeed. I'm taking a look right now at Kuro's stats. He has only ever played a single game on Jace, which was a victory, but it's been a long time, and definitely not a champion that we associate with Kuro in the same way that we would talk about Coco's Jace, for example. So a bit different here, very mid-game focused composition from the Tigers. Ajini Empire, they've got a lot of engage. They have the Sivir Ghost Olaf. That is terrifying for a backline of poking champions. So Ku going to have to be on point with their positioning. Olaf has that mini Righteous Glory with his ultimate. We'll probably buy the item as well. So many ways to launch that Viking into the backline. All right, guys, we're loading up right now. Interesting counter picks for Naja and the Empire. They have really pivoted from the last game, going much more for the engage for the 5v5, and they should have that late game advantage. Ku needs to hit hard and early if they're going to win. So let's get into game two.
Welcome to game two. Najin down 0-1 currently against the Koo Tigers after a very fast win from Koo. And uh, changing things up this time, not going for that split push. Instead, making a different tactical approach to see if they can shut down. We haven't seen a top lane Olaf in a really, really long time. And kind of the interesting thing to consider, Monte Cristo, is how are they going to lane this Olaf? Are they going to look for a lane swap? Are they going to look for the 1v1? Because traditionally, Emacs Olaf beat a lot of melee top laners. You just couldn't trade with that instant burst of over 300 true damage. I think it's down to 250 now. And max range, but of course, very short cooldown on that. The all-ins with the slows coming in consistently from the Q were a very real thing. And of course, Olaf was a flexible uh, 1v2 champion because you do have ranged wave clear with the Q. The big issue is though, although it's a melee ranged top laner, Rumble will win those damage trades, specifically before you can kind of try and outplay with the Ragnarok. So the 1v1 matchup, I think, is a really tough one to opt into here for Duke. Well, we're going to see if he chooses it or not. Uh, of course, you do have that Sivir advantage over the Corky early, so Najin may be considering that too when they plan out their laning phase. We see OQ and Pure already stacked up in those bottom brushes. Now, Corky's down here alone. Smeb, Ku, uh, or Smeb, Gorilla, and Hojin taking a look at that Gromp right now, and Prey just floating in circles serenely. He's getting pretty close, though. This could be dangerous. He's got to take a big trade early. He has to run away immediately. Didn't expect Pure to be there. There's the pulverized Prey. Has to burn that heal. Gorilla now down, but this is going to be a huge advantage for Najin. He completely chunked out of lane. Can only assume he'd already scut up the Phosphorus Bomb. Otherwise, it would have been very smart to scut up the Valkyrie at the last minute. Went for the freeze, was punished. Najin had all the extra information from just sitting in that brush and seeing the lane assignment. So that's actually a surprisingly big advantage for two minutes 30 into the game. Yeah, absolutely is. Ooh. And Duke getting very, very low right there. Calculated. Very calculated. Down to about 40 health. You got to maximize your Olaf damage, you know, with that passive. Remember you casting a game and forgetting that, of course, you just tank the turret and take it down faster. And that situation didn't even pick up the W for any sort of sustain. That was a super risky jungle clear. I really appreciate when you bring up all my mistakes Gotta on the broadcast. There aren't many of them, Marty. <laughs> there aren't many of them. It's just been a while since Olaf's been in the meta. Yep, Shy Soul Sunfire, or Soul Bearing with Sunfire. Let's get them all out there right now. All right, that's two. <laughs> I'll keep thinking. All right, so uh, Prey's back. Prey is down, though, and how are they going to play around this disadvantage that we see developing? Smeb up a level onto Duke so far. And just hanging back and absorb at least some of that damage from the Reckless Swing with his Scrap Shield. Surprising to see that Smeb in this matchup still goes for that Amp Time start. We've seen a lot of Amp Time starts from the likes of Marin, I believe, who innovated that on this uh, rumble. Of course, the extra AP helps you with your pushing options in the early game, but lack of flat health could really be taken advantage of by Duke if he can get those big damage trades in. Yeah, that's the only counter to true damage that there is. He's got to stack that health. And I'll take a look at the win rates right now. Gorilla 5-1 and one on that Braum. So certainly putting up some numbers so far. And here comes a sneaky gank from Watch. And Hojin's not here yet. Smeb is overextended for sure without jungle support. But Rek'Sai just waiting right now. Remember, you can chain those Qs together. He misses the first one. There's the ghost coming through. Smeb in a little bit of trouble, and he is going to have to flash right now the second Q. Hojin on his way. Hojin is late. Can they turn this around? There's a flash body slam. Watch getting low. Overheat about to go through for Smeb, but he goes down for first blood. Hojin still there. He's got the red buff. He may be trying to chain, but there is Duke, and he's going to block the body slam, and a double kill for Duke. Goong comes up into the river, the first to respond, and that was a nice body block from Duke to save Watch. And credit to Smeb, he managed to dodge so many axes to stay healthy, then overheated with his flame spitter on. Thought he might be able to turn it around, but is too strong in the dueling one, Najin. And credit to Goong, by far the first to rotate to that top lane skirmish. Yeah, and you do have that priority early if you are that Azir, of course, because you're going to be trying to poke out Kuros Jace. So a double kill onto Duke is about the worst thing that could happen for the Ku Tigers. They really, really need to protect that backline and a strong Olaf. 
combined with the advantage that they already have here in bot is going to be very problematic when Ku tries to hit a mid-game power spike right now. And Smep, that's the awkward thing about Rumbles, especially if you have the amp term, you're gonna push in. That's always so much counterplay about really pushing his Rumble. And this point, Hojin was out of position. Watch was certainly in position. And the moment he goes to Rumble, he knew exactly what was happening, but what's he to do? Yeah, and that's it. Uh, we've talked about this many times. If you are playing Rumble as a team, you have to coordinate the jungle pathing with your jungler because he is so vulnerable when he gets close to the enemy turret that if you're not there to counter gank, you are going to lose. And speaking of losing, Smeb can't go anywhere near this minion. It's been expertly frozen by Duke, but they're not so expertly did let one of the minions hit the turret, but he has red buff and of course has the consistent slows already. Smeb needs level six to hope to push this in with the equalizer, but nowhere near that level six power spike. No, he is not. They do have a pink ward in the tri brush. Gorilla making a play here. We see this all the time from Gorilla, going for some very aggressive attempts at the top side. This trinket ward is ticking down right now. We'll see if they have a timer on that or whether they're going to push far, too far forward too soon. There it goes down. Has the Ragnarok available now? Doesn't have Ghost. Could try and burn him down with damage, but... Yeah, really does seem rather unlikely. I have to assume he's still in the brush. Smeb still waiting for that equalizer. Not going to have that ability for a little bit of time, and everyone just backs off right now. Gorilla goes on back to a roam on the bottom side. They realize there's really nothing that they can do. The displacement, you know, if you... Throwing that cask from the out of the fog of war, maybe you can get it through, but just so much downside when you're so close to Olaf's turret that just not worth the time investment for Hojin. No, but it was a little bit of insurance. Should uh, there be a gank right there, even though it did cost them a little bit of XP to stay in that top side. And now Smeb does have level six, so he's going to be in a bit better of a position, especially as the wave is pushing back towards him. Now, killing that Rumble doesn't really do too much to his mid-game damage, though. So, Ku can still stack Dragon. Basically, at this stage, with this early deficit, Dragon is going to be the way forward. That is going to be the way they win this game. But a, a positive laning matchup suddenly becomes a super tricky one for the Rumble. He is at kill, press, at, at kill risk. A lot of times, Duke does have the ability to just ghost, use that Ragnar, and do a lot of damage. So, in terms of the 1v1, this is all, kind of always the story for Rumble, but even more pigeonholed than you would have thought in Champ Select at being a team fight force rather than being able to 1v1 the Olaf at any point in this game. Yeah, definitely a major problem right now. OQ actually staying pretty even in terms of CS with Prey, surprisingly, after that little bit of an ambush. But he did get a nice recall, so he is going to come back to lane with that BF sword, Kuro. Moving backwards as Goong tries to advance his Sand Soldier line. And here's going to be an early Dragon. This is huge for Najin. If they can get this, they are going to be in a very, very good situation. And it's free. Prey was back. OQ got the first recall because he had that lane advantage. And Gorilla was leaving, so it was easier for OQ and Pure to push it up. And now that's going to be a Dragon. That is the thing that Ku really needed to remain relevant. They just had to send multiple members to kind of fight around this top lane matchup. Worried about Smeb in that 1v1 against Duke. They've had to send Hojin. They've had to send Gorilla. They've just never been in a position to really exert any pressure or wards onto his bot side jungle. And the mid game comp loses the first dragon. That's usually a spoiler for a lost game for the Koo Tigers. Yeah, this is uh, not going well to say the least. Couldn't actually deal with the gank from Watch and now it's all falling apart. 2,000 gold and a dragon, the lead right now for Najin. Smeb starting to recover in terms of CS. Nice poke coming through from Kuro. This is definitely the time where the damage really starts to ascend for Jace. Before any armor is picked up, you can definitely boss around both tanks and squishies alike. But come 25, 30 minutes, things start to turn around and people start to out-sustain the massive poke from Jace. Yeah. But there's no one for Jace to poke right now besides the mid lane. Basically, Ku just has to sit tight until there's an objective to go after. And the world's biggest go button is coming with that catalyst purchase from Olaf. <laughs> They're basically Simmer, righteous glory. Oh, geez. Ghost. Someone's shouting free muffins, free cookies, because there's just a stampede of people who are going to be running, a cow included. So 
Pure is in the top lane already. The turret dive looms a certain possibility. And where's the equalizer? There it is, but Smev just gonna get destroyed behind his turret. Can't do much of anything. Pure with the easy tank job, with the unbreakable will. And another kill for Duke. Well, not much you can say right there. There is very little that Smeb could do against a play like that. Chose not to burn his flash, probably intelligently. And this is must-win territory for Najin. Both this game, if they want to be compared to this series, that part goes without being said. But in terms of just their playoff hopes, they have the harder running compared to Jinnah. They have to face SKT compared to Jinnah, having that unique game against Anarchy that you kind of already pencil in as a victory. If Najin lose here today, they are odds on the massive underdogs to make it to the playoffs. Yeah, that run would have to be absolutely incredible, but they're doing great here already. A tower down, more money for Duke, as he is going to be looked to carry on this game, and he's on the perfect champion against this team composition to be that big time carry. And carry top laners who can get to the back line. This is what we've been talking about. All right, the Cinder Hulk's out of the meta. There was actually a time when you and I were speculating Olaf with the TP smite might actually be coming through when the Cinder Hulk meta was just at its infant steps. It was being seen in solo queue. Never translated to competitive, but in a meta where only really Maokai has been seen as a capable top lane tank that has backline pressure against the likes of Kog'Maw, suddenly Olaf does loom, you know, in certain matchups and certain comps as a viable pick. Absolutely. So we do see the blue buff invade coming through from Najin, trying to eliminate some of these wards. Goong. Getting into a good position around this buff right here, but nothing really going to come of that yet. Just a little bit of vision as Najin moves forward on the bottom side. Smeb just trying to freeze right now back next to his turret, but he's going to be giving away a lot of presence around the red buff while that occurs. And let's remember the mind space that Najin holds for both of us, I think, for most analysts is great landing team, macro decisions, late game, you know, a bit of a question mark. It's nice to see them understand they never need to have multiple members in the top side of this jungle apart from Baron fights because Olaf versus Rumble has turned into a mismatch. Now they can just fight around the dragon. They can try and control the enemy blue. They already have a significant gold advantage, 3,000. They've got the inside track to the next dragon, having been the ones to pick up the first. Najin is winning in multiple ways as Hojin face checks a couple. And here comes the TP already on the way from uh -oh. Olaf. There's a TP from Rumble. It is going to be a bit later. Duke has the advantage. So there's the Glacial Fisher going to knock a few up. Beautiful equalizer on top of the Glacial Fisher, but is that going to be enough? OQ already here with the Sivir ultimate. And no one dies from Ku thanks to the nice disengage of the double ults from Braum and Rumble. They even win in terms of damage right there. Goong having a hard time. And Najin uh, maybe could have done a little bit better when it came to engaging that fight. They didn't have Ghost up for Olaf, and they also didn't have Sivir there, so no real way for Duke to get in, even though he had the priority with the TP. And that was definitely a case of almost for Najin. Didn't quite have the Righteous Glory finish. Went for the boots too, only had the Catalyst in the infantry. Didn't have Sivir to provide the first speed boost for the Olaf, so just couldn't get Olaf into the back line. Very much a uh, blast from the past when it comes to Olaf getting kited out of fights. That will change as the items in the game goes towards the 5v5 team fight phase. But Ku kind of get a let off there and able to go back and pick up some farm before the inevitable dragon fight in just over a minute's time. Yeah, they will have all their crucial ultimates back up by that time as well. Najin, in a very similar boat, of course. Duke now going to be trying to take the red buff to keep on split pushing. That is going to be a huge takeaway from Ku here as they try to keep their second turret in the top lane intact. Now, Watch may be playing a little bit aggressively, but not going to get too punished for it right now. Kuro still without a significant amount of damage, only that Brutalizer. I think he must be sitting on quite a lot of gold, of course. Only about 2,000 golds worth of items between the Brutalizer and the tier, so probably shopping now. Not gonna be close to the Muramana, expecting maybe a 22, 23 minute transformation for that. But of course the damage and the shock bust in general. Oh, we got it. Gonna definitely be sticking. Got the Manamune at least. But not the Muramana. Yeah, oh yes, 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 yes. The dream of the Jace with 13 minute Muramanas. <laughs> it's a couple of years out of date. I remember those days. They were not good days. The tier patches were, uh, were terrifying and it was full of top lane rise and top lane jace and cj was dominating everybody 
Man, that was a long time ago. It was a long time ago. See, why well, I mean CJ? No. They are the one in 21 and one after breaking the streak yesterday. I mean, it could have been a wrestling storyline at 21 and one. The viewers understand. <laughs> they had to do it. You can't. You can't eclipse the Undertaker. Is that what you're saying? You can never eclipse the Undertaker. Because that 21 streak was over 21 years, but you know, <laughs> other than that. Okay, so Najin gets into the Dragon Pit early. Trinity Force is done for Prey, but we see that Scuttle Crab going over to Najin. They do not have teleport, neither team does, so it looks like Ku going to be content with giving this one up. Duke just standing there, and he will be recalling, as a matter of fact. So, Tier 1 turret traded for the Dragon right now. That'll keep things at about 2,000 gold difference once Smeb actually takes down the turret. You might shake your head and say, okay, but you're giving them mid-game comp and a little bit of extra gold. They're very close to hitting their item timings. Why are you opting into this big, heavy Dragon contest if you're Najin? Why are you giving up the turret pressure when you were just headily winning this 1v1 matchup between Olaf and Rumble? Crucial factor. I mean, Kua basically picked to monopolize Dragon. That's basically their win condition with all their poke. The fifth Dragon now, even if they were able to get the inside track on the rest of them, of course, that's 30 minutes of time from now. That's 46 minutes. So even if they never contest for another Dragon, they've already basically shut out the hopes and dreams of Ku when it comes to that Dragon 5 stack. Now, I will say this. When it comes to the Ku Tigers, when they have played compositions like this in the past, they actually have been able to pull out wins in the late game due to some tricky shot calling around Baron. But it is by the skin of their teeth a lot of the time. And we don't even see that tower and top lane go down. Ku didn't have any vision, so I think they thought that Olaf backed sooner than he did. And he also bought the home guard boots, so Smep pulled off the turret a little bit early because he was afraid of getting caught in infinite axe chains from Duke if he happened to be in that top side. He knew that the ghost was up. So not actually going to get the objective, and that just means that the Tigers trade that dragon for nothing, and this mid lane turret is so close to dying. You have to think they'll rotate around bottom. They already have a Sivir who has a lot of turret pressure. Goom's looking for an auto attack, doesn't get it. Takes out aggro, but it's definitely going to be the turret coming down. It's Goom. Uh -oh. Ooh. Missed skill shot from Kuro. Goom was 100% dead there if that had landed. Oh, it was overkill. 300 damage overkill at least. Those uh, EQs are hitting for around 500 damage at this stage of the game. Wow, so another mechanical misplay from the Ku Tigers could have resulted in something. Goong uh, kind of questionably going deep right there. Had his barrier, but I think he still would have died. That was almost Lee Syndrome. I don't know if there's a word for Azia Syndrome. <laughs> but the Birdman certainly went far too aggressive, just with no provocation. He was, there was nothing he was going to get from taking that uh, uh, gap closer. Yeah, no, absolutely not. So kind of odd misplays by both of the mid laners. And now, here comes Watch. He wants to get around. They want this last Tier 1 turret taken away from Ku. Checking for the blue buff right now. He will be seen with the Wolf Spirit. I'm waiting for Jason Gragas to come in. In fact, Gorilla's trying to head off as well. We put some 5v5 action around this blue, but it's enough to at least get the buff onto uh -oh. Jason. Maybe the start fight starts. Our Gorilla goes in. He gets the Glacial Fisher, but there's nothing else. And look at this Duke already in the back line, TPing deep into the fight. He gets chunked out early, however. Prey on his own right here. Prey has to deal with this Ludens Echo is here. He's trying to run. Actually gets the flash off, or the heal off, rather. Nearly takes out OQ. Can't quite make the play, so the dive complete. Gorilla goes in, but the rest of his team was cut off by the Olaf teleport, and that was it. So two for none. Turret goes down in favor of Najin as they continue to extend this gold lead. 6,000 gold and two dragons to zero against a mid-game comp. It's scary spot for Kuro and for this Kulan. Look at this return damage coming through from this Azir. Yeah, there's that echo just bouncing between members of Ku early on. They just don't have any magic resist at this point in time, so nothing they can do against Kung's Azir. And Ku, they got to do something or they're going to get perfect game. They don't have turrets, they don't have kills, they don't have any dragons. And this, the two factors that really came up big here were Prey eating that trade at level one, and then the misplay. Oh, okay, uh -oh. goodbye, Smab. You are gone. 
going to try and flash for this, but the axes are still coming through. One more, and there's going to be the disengage, but they have to use so much for that. And the Ragnarok wasn't quite off cooldown just now, awkwardly, if you're Duke, but Spam can never be that far down the lane unless they put multiple wards into really getting sort of defensive vision. He just can't be within axe range of this Olaf. Well, Najin has done a great job of advancing their ward line, though, throughout this game. They have the deep wards on both sides of the map, and now who's in this situation where they have to push up to the tier ones, they have to get some vision denial in their own jungle because otherwise the flanks from this Olaf are just going to destroy them. And look, Koo picked the comp that needs to take the initiative, that needs to make the mid game their own. As Duke, he has Ragnarok available, he's gonna have to use it. Will he get away? Winter's by has been hit, but able to just casually saunter away as um, the Ola. <laughs> that's the power of the Ragnarok, of course. Has the glory too, does use it. Prey under the tower right now. Watch is gonna find him. Prey gets hit by the chilling smite and OQ with the finisher on the kill, thanks to the help of On The Hunt. So another dive, Prey just can't do anything. And Naja doing a great job of snowballing this game. He's playing around winning lanes expertly, uh, Naja. And they have the superior wave clear in every lane. And look, who have so few resources they have access to to get back into this game. They want to farm up, even though they don't have the late game, they want to at least be able to opt into fights. But even with their earlier power spikes, they're behind in items, they're behind in gold, and they're certainly behind in objective. Yep, and they can't stop their towers from being chipped. It's way too safe for Najin to push up to a tier two with the vision control that they currently have. They have wards in all the right places right now. They're pretty much no avenues that Ku can take through their own jungle that won't be seen. So that's, as long as they continue to split push, they can 1-3-1 this all day and keep pressing their edge. So Dragon is live, third Dragon of the game very early because of how soon and how quickly Najin took the first one. They're looking for it. Duke doesn't have TP, but he's making his way down. He's trying to buy time for Duke to come out. They want to avoid being chunked out. Jay still has a lot of damage. Duke's in a nice spot. Has the Ragnarok. And here we go. Ragnarok is popped. He's trying to get the backside. Glacial Fisher goes down. Hoja the first to fall, but Pure just tanking away all of that poke with the Alistair ult in the front line. And Najin doesn't have to engage this. They can just go straight to the Dragon right now. Hojin already down, that smite not going to be there for a possible steal. On the hunt wasn't available, it is now in the re-engage, but potential is real. And there they go, Kuk oh. actually goes in way too early compared to his team. Duke knocked backwards by Kuro, no Ragnarok to prevent that CC, so awkward engage now. Prey still on the outside, Kuro in a duel in the mid lane. Prey looks like he's going to live. Actually, Jace takes down Olaf, so a couple of kills for the Ku Tigers on a sloppy re-engage by Najin and Gorilla just a bit too tanky. Here we go, watch coming through with the Void Rush. Goodbye, Kuro. Eventually, he will get chilled and smote to death. Chilled and smote. Sounds like what you ask for when you get your uh, drinks at the cocktail bar, Monster Christo. Yeah, chilled and smote? Yep. Well, I do like my cocktails dead. Not too, not too into the living ones. Fair enough. And speaking of living, Dragon's not gonna be doing any more living. 3-0 and oh now, we're gonna see a replay. This was sloppy from Koo. Even the on the hunt usage was a little bit late and Goon just got free DPS to death. Yeah, that was very odd. You can see the coordination around Najin not really there in that engage. They do try and get Prey around the side, but Kuro, you can't just leave him there. Jace is incredibly strong in 1v1 situations, especially when he switches to that hammer stance. He can hit you like a truck and has a nice execute too, so you have to be very careful. Duke didn't have anything available for that engagement. Doesn't really matter though, Najin has such a huge edge. I mean, Najin had a huge edge, but Duke really misplayed there. Remember, he was the one who was 4-0 and before he fell to Jace, but the crucial factor, he's got health, but basically itemized purely into magic resist. So opting into a fight against a Jace with no armor, you have to pay for it. <laughs> you do have to pay for it. So. Dragon, or Baron rather now, Najin's objective of choice in this game. They can do it very, very quickly with Azir and the true damage from Olaf, so Ku Tigers have to be particularly cautious. Your amount of transform is through, but crucially no last whisper just yet. The item floor, these, the items that a Jace needs to be relevant is very, very low. Just really needs those two armor penetration items and to transform that Mirror Mana. He's perilously close to that stage, but 
kind of needs it. They need to win the next engagement coup, otherwise this game, I mean, all the neutral buffs, all the global gold has gone to Najin in the early game, who definitely missed their window. But we're not even going to be talking about windows oh, if there's another oh, oh, oh. fighter. Casually steals with the barrel. Uh, barrel steal for Hojin. Uh, watch did not have a smite available, I think. He seems to want to use it. Not really any way to engage in these narrow crevices. So Najin just trying to poke around and clear some waves. Yeah, they, that is one thing that Najin have to be careful of. If, the, if they try and engage through a choke point against Fisher and Equalizer, they will be in a world of hurt and get kited out by the poke. So Hojin going to get caught right here. Can he get over the wall? Nope. Just burst it into oblivion. Throws a party cask at his feet, but just uh, disperses the enemy, not really causing much threat. So Najin here trying to get onto this Baron right now. Ku, and there's oh. a great engage from Pure. Gorilla responds with the Glacial Fisher. Prey here, and here comes to on the TP. Look at that fast Viking just running down the opposition. Gets Spep underneath his turret, and now they can turn onto the Baron with another couple of kills. Duke's Lovely flash headbutt pulverized from the Alistair. Yeah, and Duke's TPs have been much more on point this game. You have to hand it to him. That has been a problem for this team in the past, is Duke being there on time, but he has delivered in this game. So Duke's someone, of course, had an excellent spring season. He's an excellent 1v1 laner, but teleport plays, not what we really know him for, is Najin do pick up this Barons, I think they just put the training wheels on Monster Crusher. I think they just said, okay, seven games of Maokai. If you can't learn teleport play with seven games of Maokai, mate, top lane's not for you. It certainly worked out here. Yeah, it's it has been much better. He's been getting onto some good wards too. It's also helped that Najin has had some nice vision control in this game, so he's had a few choices to make on how to get into the back line. And this Olaf just out of control right now. I think Najin are really showing where the vision meta is going. So we talk a lot about the champion picks, but when it comes to vision, it feels like Jin Air was maybe the first team to have the inside track on understanding that warding totems, just that much more powerful than even having four sweepers, as we can see that Ku has, is he just can't clear out three wards a person when basically five members of the team, sometimes four if uh, pilot's playing, has that ability to put down three wards. There's always going to be that flank ward when we're talking about the potential of 15 wards, green wards, and some pinks out on the map. Yeah, absolutely. But I mean, the sweepers with a poke comp like this, where you want to deny the flank wards as much as you can, certainly have their own value. But yes, in this situation, playing from this far behind, you're just not going to outward notch, and there will always be choices for them to make. Spab, huge amount of damage onto him. Baron buff is here for Notch and should be a pretty easy win. And in the first best of three, we've come to see a couple of very one-sided series. And quite honestly, both teams' strengths. Ku winning in the first game by having a better draft and for playing as a team better. And Najin winning just out of the laning phase in the second as Ku makes some pretty terrible errors early on in lane. And that gives Najin such a foothold that there isn't any coming back with their mid-game composition. Yeah, you've been able to tank up this outer tower, finally break the base. What's Ku to do? They just watch on as Najin take free objectives. Yeah, here we go, Hojin chucked out immediately. OQ just gonna finish off some kills with some auto attacks right now. Equalizer and Fisher are down, but that doesn't prevent Najin from just flashing forward onto the rest of the Ku Tigers. And now Najin will back off turn their sights on the inhibitor instead. They're going to try and use this Baron buff to get some of these Nexus turrets down right away. And the death time is still 30 seconds for Prey. They're going to get one Nexus turret. I think they can finish the game. It seems like Najin know just that. And that's it. Going to be a 29-minute game for Najin Empire. They do win game two. A couple of stomps coming in early. That sends us to a game three between these two teams. It is so fitting that Najin just wins one game out of the laning phase. Ku Tigers just win one game out of having that great draft and superior strategy on the map. Very characteristic of both of these organizations. It feels like Najin, for example, Najin versus KT happened twice in two weeks, 2-0 two stomps each way. These teams, you know, that are fighting for those playoff positions are quite even. They can trade wins, and Najin keep their slim playoff hopes alive. They still have four series to play, including this one. But with the harder run, Jin Air will be very confident on that champion. It still looms as a possible jungle pick, despite some of the shifts in the meta.
Indubitably. So, Ku Tigers, Alistair will be the first ban. Ku may just be going for those Alistair, Annie, and Lucian bans that they had in game one, taking away Najin's ability to hard engage, which is great because Najin, not the best team when it comes to coordinating around team fights. And if you give, if you take away the easy ways to do it, instant stun from Annie, long range engage from Alistair, Najin may have trouble actually coordinating all of their members getting in onto the Ku Tigers at the proper timing. And remember, when those options were gone, what did they have to default to? That risky mid lane choice, the Twisted Fate, that certainly didn't pay off in game one. So guaranteed, guaranteed CC and engage seems to be at a premium for Najin, and Ku have got the read on that with these two bands, same as game one. And you have to think the Lucian ban will also be coming out here against OQ. They've stuck with that one the last two games, and I don't think they're going to want to mix it up. Game one, they first picked Braum. But you have to think the likes of Maokai and Kog'Maw will go higher in priority for Najin. Maokai was banned last uh, game, so we'll see if there's anything different. Certainly not on Ku's side, as you mentioned. Strange World Volution needs to be banned, but his performance against Anarchy, 17, 1, and 6, I think, was his score that game. He just <laughs> blew them away. <laughs> yeah, it was uh, quite spectacular. So, we do have the Rise, of course, banned last. Now, the question is, is the Braum still the first pick? It's been taken in the first round of the draft on both sides by the Ku Tigers so far. But in game one, Najin kind of made a bizarre choice. Janna Rek'Sai. I don't think they're going to make that mistake again. There's no need to take the Jana that early in the draft. Grab something with higher priority. So just think about the options. Braum, Maokai, and Kog'Maw, to me, are the three chambers that were left open that should be considered. The thing about Braum, so flexible. It's weird. You know, we had him thought of as only that disengaged support, but the, li the rise of the likes of the mid Ezreal has shown that there's so many champions that can apply. You know, Yasuo in game one we saw the concussive blows and the fact that he can go from being counter engaged but also excellent on teams that are looking to engage has just meant that his priority has shot up as Rek'Sai is being thought about so maybe no Janna this time now. Well, the Rek'Sai is fine. Sure. If they want to take that I can agree with that and they're going to maybe take the Azir early that's not really been a big pick for Kuro mm. so they're giving up Maokai they're giving up Kog'Maw here. Kog'Maw went through the picks and bans so it wasn't must pick, must ban, at least judging on game two. I feel like maybe there's always a spot for that champion given just his strength and the lack of backline in the meta. So we'll see if they still default to the similar sort of picks. You know, on this side we saw the Maokai and the Gragas be locked in for Ku, and maybe that's that time again. Or you can go for this duo that I think is the strongest red side duo, the strongest backline, most reliable top laner, and the guy who does the most damage. Yep. Absolutely, and you don't need to take the Gragas right now. We've seen some players play top lane Gragas, notably Ixu, mm. uh, if they want to deny multiple junglers to the enemy, but I don't think we're going to be seeing that from Duke. So, I don't know, Ku looking like they have an extraordinarily powerful draft coming through. I think Najin's going off meta with this top laner. I think Singed or Olaf has to be the top because you need something that can either cause disarray or get onto this Kog'Maw because First four picks sometimes can do it, but certainly no reliable backline engage from the first four picks from Najin, given what they're mousing over at the moment. Yeah, they have to have something in store. Mm -hmm. Leona would definitely be a solid choice that would give them the kind of engage that they need, even though it's less reliable than Alistor or Annie, because that uh, solar flare is just fundamentally more difficult to hit. I think Thresh, even though Pure is a plenty fine Thresh player, not going to be the right selection for this composition. You need something to engage, and that Leona would fit the bill. Not gonna go for it though, Thresh and Sivir instead. I'll reserve my judgment till we see what backline top laner we're gonna see coming through from Najin. I kind of side with you on that one, but Last time we saw Leona, it was Leona versus Annie, which is an excellent laning matchup, and the Leona Corky could run wild over the Annie lane, just bodying out that low, uh, low health stacking, very brittle Annie support. Brom's a different kettle of fish, you know, both of them all in supports on one level, but if you make any mistakes as Leona, the concussive blows will stack up because you're getting into that uber melee range, and you might get punished. So the laning matchup is certainly not as ideal as that in that particular situation. Ku. I mean, they could basically ape what they put together in that previous series. So just waiting to see where they want to solidify this comp. Yeah, hovering over 
the Lulu, they could go for something like a Juggermaw. They could also just play the Yasuo one more time, although that's not going to be as effective against the Azir as their previous composition. And they do not have a knockup from the jungle. Yep, so it will be a, a Juggermaw. I think this is a better choice given what they've seen so far. Control the mid lane with the Lulu. So the inventors of the Juggermaw will be returning to that strategy we have. The Evelyn pick, even though it's against a Rek'Sai, Wisdom has been very good at his flank engages with that champion. Plenty of peel. Najin has to have an answer. How do they kill the Kog'Maw here? How do they deal with the Maokai? It's such a strong laner in so many different matchups. Where are they going to go? The Olaf would certainly be a risk, but maybe necessary to actually get onto this combo with so much peel from so many members. You need a curveball from the top lane. I hope they have something very special planned out here. That is not special enough. Rumble is basically saying we will control that dragon or we will lose the game in the late game. So they thought about something special. You could argue that Rumble's stronger on this pack because of the indirect buffs to the itemization, but this is very safe, maybe to a, a fault for a Najin team that must win this game to really solidify their hopes for playoffs. I mean, basically, you're looking at either a Miracle Hook or an Azir Sec to actually kill the Kog'Maw, and even then it's not a guaranteed thing by any means. You have a Leona here, at least you have a reliable form of primary engage. That is completely off the table right now with this Thresh pickup. They can still go for pick play, but this is going to be really, really hard for Najin. Yeah, their hopes of getting picks completely rely on just monopolizing vision around the map, denying that vision with the likes of sweepers, and setting up around objectives. And if any of those variables fall down, so will their comp. Yeah, well, Ku Tigers, they have some strong lanes here. They're going to be feeling good about how this game is going. They should be very safe in the early game. They have some nice kill pressure onto the Rumble in the top side. They have an advantageous matchup in the Kog'Maw Braum on the bottom side. And Lulu just sit there wave clearing. They can easily just hold out until the late game where Praise Juggermaw will be unstoppable. The Ku Tigers, a team that really know how to use this composition. We'll see if they can pull it off one more time. First time they've tried it in a while. Let's get into game three. Well, possibly playoff seeds on the line in this game, depending on how the rest of this season pans out. Ku Tigers trying to struggle their way up the ladder, trying to take that number two seed, which is still well within their grasp. Najin attempting to even make it squeak into the playoffs at number six. Prey and a Papa Ward in there. Fool me once, shame on me. Instantly cleared this time. Or fool so. me once, shame on you. Excuse me. Wow, I messed that up. Exactly the opposite, Papa Smithy. I didn't even call you on it. I, I was going to leave it to you, Monty, just like when I was talking about that Olaf thing before. <laughs> You'll call me out on it like a year later. All right. I play the long game. <laughs> so Ku have a big advantage in the mid lane. We were watching the pool party Lulu skin earlier. It's completely adorable. So when it comes to that, they certainly have a right advantage in the mid lane. Just watching going, he's considering a late invade, now just warding down. Of course, Maokai probably setting up his saplings very shortly. Looks like they're gonna get that early little bit of experience that honestly can tip mid lane matchups from time to time. Yep, certainly nice to have it at the very least. And we are going to have a lane swap. So Najin saw the ward go into the brush and they're going to opt out of the 2v2, something that we don't really see from Najin that often. If you see a ward going down in a brush like that, you can pretty much be guaranteed that it was the AD carry putting it down. So with that information, they're going to choose to swap around. And now the top lane controlled by Ku freezes from our teams coming in. And Pure actually just gonna fast push this with the help of OQ. Interesting, not something we see very often. So the response to seeing this is that Gorilla is going to immediately recall so that Smeb can get a quick TP or even just walk into this bottom side safely. So there we go. 
already coming through, and Ku doesn't have to worry about a dive. They know that nobody's in their bottom side jungle, so very safe play. But the big reason that Ku is making these rotations around the bottom lane, the reason why they want two members on the bottom side of the map is that if vertical jungling, which would have naturally meant that there would be more members of Najin on the bottom side of the map, and thus likely led to dragon control, had extended, the Dragon is the real win condition here for Najin. They have the Rumble, they have the earlier power spikes. They want to play around that objective. So sending multiple members down bot for Ku at least eliminates any hope for that six, seven minute Dragon sneak to really get Najin rolling with this Dragon-centric comp. Yeah, it, it could have presented a lot of problems, but it's not, especially now that it's going to be a 2v1 hmm. in this bottom side. We do see that pure just trying to harass early on as Wisdom took his blue buff and then wanted to make a play for the Rift Scuttler. So they're trying to defend Rumble, and this is uh, what we didn't see happen in the last game from Ku. As Rumble pushes up, they want to get that vision advantage, make it as safe as they can. And now Wisdom is going to come around to the lane to try and give Prey a little bit of a helping hand with three Najid members up in the top lane. It's still really weird to see a team on the red side play so much around the top to try and force a counter swap to just really try and change things. Maybe they just want to reslip by that ball. Oh, it's Goom. Okay. There's the stun. And there's the Ignite going down too. They're going to flash forward for this Kuro. Not quite going to get the kill. Uh, a little bit awkward. Two Ignites looks like they were used at the same time. So stacking those Ignites and wasting a summoner spell right there. This is kind of the weird execution that we see from the Ku Tigers from time to time. Lack of coordination, and that means that they do not make the most out of that kill. Now they get a good shot time, 25 to 17 CS, but only a non-magic mantle, so not able to get a lot of big combat stats as far as we can see here. Yeah, just vision after that, so actually the mana regen, so therefore offensive capability advantage in the mid lane goes to good. Yeah, interesting. I mean, obviously no first blood, a result, so a very just slim advantage. Goom did have to burn both summoner spells. But now Gorilla may not have all the tools he needs if there were to be a gank, if Najin wants to push forward in that top side. Meanwhile, Goong just happily sitting next to his turret right now. And OQ coming up with a pretty big CS lead, actually. I think this is actually really smart play from Najin. So what they've forced is the counter swap. So now we're seeing the bot lane up the top for Kuz. So they've effectively lane swapped themselves. Now we have Siva versus Maokai in the bottom lane. Of course, Siva's going to have that instant wave clear they have now have a large black area around dragon especially when the latest uh, vision starts to go away and maybe they can get that dragon control that they really so desperately want yeah that well it's interesting to see where gorilla is going on the map this game because he's been all over the place it's unchained yeah he is <laughs> gorilla is unchained this game Prey just sitting up mostly by his lonesome in top, and this is where Prey sometimes starts to get behind in CS. He's had to deal with three people. He's been denied in the top side, and that was came at the expense of that gank in mid lane, but without actually a kill, it was a lot of resources lost, and Najin ended up with the better end of that deal when you consider everything going on. They're gonna try and take the long way around here, oh but boy. they don't have an ignite. A lot of damage and CC potentially coming through. Of course, on hit effects being applied by the Ravage. Evelyn uh -oh. Z. Duke spotted this. And they're going in on to Na Lulu actually in the mid side. So Kuro in a lot of danger and first blood actually passed over to watch. It was so trained on following Ku's rotation that we completely missed Najin playing around mid, taking out Kuro. Nice movements by Najin. Yep. Just three people in that mid lane. They got the catch they needed. They had the flash. Available from Pure, probably was just a flash flay into a flash knockup from Watch to set that up, and no summoners and no wild growth from Kuro. Turn that into a kill. Pure wants to play aggressively. They force the flash from Smeb. One place where Thresh may have ascendancy over the Braum. The Braum is a very strong early Roma. Gorilla has been unchained, like we said, but. You know, when we're talking about what lane swaps provide is it allows these supports to really be freed up to impact lanes. You feel like Thresh with his three abilities, just that much more reliable, and especially at helping the jungler get involved in a skirmish, and it proved true in the mid lane. Yeah, we may see a dive now in top, uh, playing around Duke. 
the Evelyn is there. They know they need to do something right now to get themselves back into this game, but everyone just going to recall, and we're going to return to standard lanes. Let's take a look at this. There is the Flash Winter's Bite, but... A oh, oh, the auto attack cancel from Prey was could potentially have been massive there, and so much expense. Look at those flashes. Four flashes basically used in unison. That is such a huge investment. Smeb obviously had to use his to avoid the play being made on the bottom side of the match, but the map. But Najin now has so many different choices they can make. Oku still has his flash against two flashless duo laners in the bottom side as they return to that lane. So Ku having a lot of execution issues early in this one. Who's going to rotate first? We might see a lot of action around this red buff, but no, everyone backs away. Oh, we're trying to contest the objective there. Up in top, it's one of the rare times that Rumble has actually really ascended in this matchup against Maokai. 15 CS ahead, has his really early core in the Haunting guys. Okay, not really kill pressure yet, but Rumble versus Maokai for once, tipping towards the Yordle. Yeah, it is. And he, that's allowing him to play further up in the lane. Wisdom now trying to clear out some of these wards. Before we saw Ku uh, swap back into the bottom side, Watch was able to put in a bunch of wards around those objectives. He's now just going to get the red buff for free. Looks like Wisdom going to have to go into top side of enemy jungle to steal the red in turn, just smartly giving that one up. Not wanting to fight right now when his team is behind on summoner spells. He's playing around the vision that he has. Okay, now Duke spots the fact that blue buff is up, so potential two buffs being contested by Najin. Who's on the invade? Evelyn's a little bit precarious here and has to back away from the red. Yeah, Duke. No flash. Ooh. Nice dodge. Fancy footwork from Wisdom's Evelyn, but Duke still playing very well around his team's power this game. We saw him drop down into the river when that big gank uh, attempt came through from Ku, and now just going back to pr protect his red buff. He pushed up, had the time in order to do that. So great map sense from Duke, not something that we normally see from this player. And he's had to have great map sense because he's been playing aggressively despite having no defensive vision on the top side of the map at all. They only had the aggressive vision on the enemy red. So for a time, they had a good understanding of where Evelyn was, but apart from that, just really had his top lane sense to understand where the jungle was at, and in this case, on point. Definitely was. So Prey, he needs to keep on farming down here, but he's also fallen behind in terms of CS, so he will be delayed on that Trinity Force pickup. Wisdom still lurking now, trying to find something here on the bottom side, but instead just has to go back and do the Krugs. Man, this really feels like we're back to season one. So it's the Juggamore, which is already, of course, not season one, I say season one of this season. <laughs> spring Split is what I'm trying to say, but we're going back to Spring Split because the Juggamore is back. They're losing the early game here, Aku in every lane. They're setting themselves up for a very big late game with the team comp they've chosen, but this is kind of the trademark coup where they really have to work against adversity rather than get any sort of an early snowball that they were really managing in the last month or so. Oh, man, they were just so close to executing some of these plays too, both the mid lane gank and the top lane gank failing by a, the smallest of margins, really. And that auto attack animation started. If he, if he had gotten just the bio arcane barrage off and kept that distance, then would have been stunned to the top side and then Goong nearly going down in the mid lane, but over committing, and now the dragons start to come through for Naja the Empire. That is going to be highly useful. Again, another early dragon in this game. They're going to start the clock on the five dragon very quickly, and now they have the first dragon at 11 minutes. They have a 2K gold lead, and that's uh, dangerous, very dangerous right now for the Ku Tigers. Even though they have the better late game composition, the timer has started for them. In the game. What will it look like at 40 minutes? The big question is now presented because, of course, the fifth dragon going to be around the 35 to 40 minute mark. Watch, takes the Winter's Bite, but is able to get away. I mean, the big thing for Najin, the big thing for playing into Juggermore Comp is if you can break the base, certainly there are a lot of options for you in the late game. But if they can just hold on to their turrets, power up, of course, quite a cheap build going to be coming through from both the Lulu and Maokai in terms of team fight readiness, and then just wait out those item timings on Prey. Juggermore is always relevant. Yeah, that is, that is very true. And the siege here is just so good 
from the Koo Tigers with that, they have decent wave clear from Najin for sure, but again, yeah, the, the relevance, the eternal relevance of the Kog'Maw in the late game with the Juggermaw is just one of the strongest compositions in the game if you can get it there, if you can get it to work. So Wisdom will be seen here from Watch, who's been doing a very good job in this series of just keeping control of the enemy jungle to his credit and he's just gonna keep on preventing Wisdom from actually doing these Raptors. He doesn't have Smite up, so he can't really contest it, but he does force Kuro out of lane. The ones on the other side of this matchup is Watch. Of course, so frequently he's been the Evelyn who has to deal with the fact that Rek'Sai has that Tremor sent. He's been the one that's had to deal with one of his lanes not having pressure and just being invaded on as the Evelyn. Finally, the shoe is on the other foot, and it's good to see that Watch can play that aggressive style as well. Yes, so uh, Smeb and Duke here. Still not too much of a difference. Smeb just catching up in terms of his CS, so not so far behind. Goong actually getting harassed there. Nice Glitter Lance to secure the ward kill. And Watch just zooming into the Raptor pit, but no real play onto the mid lane. Love the topside warding that's come through from Najin. Ward those camps. That's the only way that you can make the green wards work against Evelyn, and they've had near complete vision. Remember, we already saw Wisdom clear a ward at the Krugs. Now he goes to the top side of the map. No coincidence that all his buffs are warded. Yep. It's, it's just been such a great warding series. Last couple of games, oh, there's a the Glacial Fisher going down. OQ getting prey very low on an all-in. Looks like a hook may have found prey underneath the turret and triggered that attempt. Wisdom's here, but he's getting tied up by Watch, actually, in the tri brush. Pure will be slowed down with the help of those concussive blows. Prey is low, but Prey does have Summoner heal. Here comes the TPs. They're going to try and make a play. Prey pops the heal. He's going to kite this one out. There's a hook on the Gorilla. There's the Equalizer coming in, but it doesn't really hit anybody. Smeb is now here, too. They are going deep, but the turret is down. And now Smeb gets bounced out. Goog with the ultimate. Wild Growth is there. And Kuro going for it. Can't quite get the kill. And Prey dies on the bottom side. Somehow to OQ, but a trade as the Ignite ticks away onto Goong. Still though, tower a couple of kills and trade for just one, and a lot of summoners used once again by the Tigers. And you're just opting into fights, unfortunately, Ku. In fact, Najin forcing fights before all those timings are hit. The Juggermore is a comp that requires specific timings, but Rumble first to react, very nice equalizer. Watch escapes on just a slither of health. Speaking of this, we're going to see a lot of very close calls in this fight. Yeah, OQ just flashing forward with the boomerang blade to keep it out. No peel remaining to punish OQ for the aggressive flash. So he does end up getting away with it. And with that kill, so only a single kill there. And it's on to Lulu, not exactly the best target. And that will increase Notchin's gold lead to about 3,000. Dangerous times for the Tigers. Finally, some items being hit. Righteous Glory was picked up. Athene's also finished. Crucially, Trinity Force not done. And at 15 minutes, starting to shape as quite a late Trinity Force. Able to go OQ. The Berserker's Greaves, the flat AD building to the Infinity Edge, and the Avarice Blade. So I have to think that gold is starting to grow and grow between the AD carries. And when you're so reliant on this Kog'Maw for damage, that is not a great place to be in. Smab just going to pop his ultimate to clear the wave. And Prey trying to find some CS where he can on the map. They flipped him into the top side now that there's no dragon to actually contest. And Smeb gonna go hungry for a little bit. He is now just changing lanes so that Prey can absorb all of this farm because they know they need him to be relevant. Swapping around the Kog'Maw is a prerequisite for the Juggernaut comp. If he's not damaged relevant, he doesn't hit his timings, the team comp just doesn't function. Oh, the, the death sentence just goes wide onto Wisdom. Yeah, tried to Lantern, watch in there, but there just wasn't any kind of summoner spells to use to actually secure a kill. And now we're back to standard lanes as Kogma comes up into mid to help out clear these waves and try and start to group. They, if they can get a couple towers, the Koo Tigers will be in a good place to get back into this. But against the wave clear no. seems unlikely. Yeah, There's just no way to do it, Monte Cristo. This is a win for Najin if they're forcing Kog'Maw to abandon deep freezing a minion wave and picking up CS and force the Juggermore come to make the aggressive moves around second Dragon Timer. 
already now just really got into the headspace of the Juggernaut comp that just wants to be pushing as much farm and levels as possible onto Prey. That said, if they can get this Dragon and extend the game as mm. a result, they will be in a good position. So they've already it's leashed risky. it. It's risky. Azir's not there, though. Yeah, no Azir, so actually Ku going to get away with this. Even Prey, oh, they back off. I think they could have finished that yeah, for the sure. sense spotted them out, but would have spotted the defense. Would they have gone for a rash 4v5 fight there, Nigel? We'll never know, as Ku made the really defensive play. Yeah, they did, and starting to leash that, and they just are kind of aimlessly wandering around the map right now. Prey went down to the bottom side to try and move this minion wave and make it reverse direction so they could actually get some pressure, but now they have to return into mid. And when they had that 4v5 and they had the angle, I mean, right there, they could have just taken the dragon and then dropped down into the bottom lane. So still a lot of gold onto this Lulu. That has been unspent. OQ takes the time to just get out. At the very least, delaying the dragon is OK, if still not ideal for the Tigers. And Najin, they get a free shot onto OQ. He was sitting on 1550 gold, finishes the Infinity Edge. The power difference between these 280 carries, it is that 1500 gold. It translates into a whole lot of power for OQ. Yeah, it does. And they still need to shop on Akuro, who's in a similar gold situation. So that is going to prompt the dragon. It was delayed by a minute or two, but that's still not. Oh, I don't know if they can go on to this. This is extremely risky. Kogma and Evelyn still are not there. Nargent burning it down, down to a thousand health. Who just give up in any hopes? Maybe they can push down the mid lane and get that turret you spoke about before. They're out of position, but that turret is so damn healthy. Yeah, on nearly 100% HP. Who just, they have to go back and have this Lulu shop right now if they want to have any kind of magic damage. Of course, big waves developing in the side lanes, so the, that kind of control. Uh, will cause some minions lost from Najin, at least in top side. OQ will pick up absolutely everything. Avarice Blade. Yeah, it's a lot of extra money. Investment banker Siva really needs to give some advice to this Kog'Maw because she's found <laughs> so much gold. Her return is so much better right now. But she's a person, and Kog'Maw is just a void for him. I don't think he has any need for investments. Did he miss the financial accounting 101? Uh-oh. Righteous Glory out of Duke now in top lane wisdom here. They want to turn this around. There's the Evelyn ultimate. Not sure they have the damage to actually follow up on this. And the answer is no. Uh, no, that is a terrible flash. Miscommunication from the Tigers on whether they were going in. And that's going to Meanwhile. cost them a mid lane turret and a tier two turret. Man, Ku just falling apart this game. And Najin in that must win. It was looking forlorn after the game one, but wow, what a turnaround. And Ku, they're just kind of folding like a pack of cards. I don't, I don't know what is happening right now. Uh, Ku used to have this bad habit where if they got behind, Hojin would just gank top lane, whether there was a kill possible or not. And it's weird to me that Wisdom would do the same thing. Obviously different players, but perhaps it's Smeb who starts calling these plays at the top side. When, uh, when things start to go poorly, but you lost two towers because you couldn't maintain any kind of control once you showed your jungler for absolutely nothing. Yeah, the traditional Juggernaut comps, it was usually the Nunu jungle that, of course, usually had some semblance of control given that it was just such a, had a strong penchant for counter jungling. Evelyn versus Rek'Sai is a jungle ma mismatch. It is a jungle matchup that we see heavily go in the advantage of Rek'Sai, especially if you have lane pressure. And remember, 15 minutes into the game, every lane was losing for Ku. How is Evelyn supposed to function and not just become effectively a moving green ward when there's just no pressure at all for Ku? Yeah, it also brings up the question of why not Gragas this game? Because, it was available too. Yeah, Gragas is a great disengage champ. Evelyn is only really useful for engage. And you definitely want to be kiting if you are the Ku Tiger. So a huge deficit developed right now. And Ku with their 6K gold in the hole and really no way to get back into this game. I mean, basically Najin just controlling everything. They can force face checks now onto the Baron. Really, really questionable micro play from the Ku Tigers over the course of this series. Yeah, the previous kings of the Juggermore, you know, bringing it back, and now back in theaters, the Juggermore. Feels a bit like Indiana Jones 4 coming out here, Monster uh, I am so glad I have never seen that movie, Papa Smithy. I heard how terrible it was, and I refuse to ever watch it. I'm a happier person. I wish I could delete the Matrix sequels and the Star Wars prequels from my brain. 
but I can't do that. But I did avoid that one. I learned my lesson. The pain of those films drove me away from Indiana Jones 4. Perhaps it will happen with the new Star Wars movie this year. I'm going to wait a long time before seeing that. Won't be rushing to the theaters. I'm going to assemble a large body of opinions before I make that decision as to whether I want Star Wars ruined some more or not. And look, you've grown to make some good decisions about the movies that you watch, but if you delete those old movies from your memory, won't that make it more likely for you to make those bad decisions? Uh, no, no, it will not, because I should have just trusted in the in the will of the so you're critics in the first you place. You were not excited for the Star Wars Episode One. Come on, we were all excited. There was so much hope. Yes, no, there wasn't. There was not hope. There was hope. It was a dark time. Dark time for the Ku Tigers, <laughs> also here. Yeah, very systematic destruction of every single little piece of vision for Ku. Waiting for our Jar Jar Blinks moment. Binks, it's not Blinks. That's how I remember it. That's how much. That's how much attention I was paying. He's not. Uh, he's not having some problems with his eyes. Uh, I don't know what a Binks is besides just a terrible name. Makes him sound like a Muppet. He's not coming back in the next movie, is he? Thank God. Sergeant have a lot of control. Gorilla's caught. He is caught right in the choke point, but he's got enough tankiness. Meanwhile, Prey actually does do some damage, but Ooh. there is a brutal Azir play from Goon. Comes in. No more damage. Nacha just going to clean this up and take a Baron. No problem. Equalizer goes down onto Kuro. Kuro has to run. And now Nacha taking the Baron and more than likely this game. This is huge for them, keeping their playoff hopes alive. And Prey's mis mispositioning at the start of the season is one of the reasons Ku had a really shaky start to the season. He was playing the likes of Siva, getting caught on trademark champions like the Siva and Gorky. Now we return to one of the most important positional comps in League of Legends, the Juggermaw, and honestly dies with his flash up. He kind of paid for the sins of Gorilla, but he did not need to be there after the first hook and CC came well, down. I'm not even sure he had time to flash, honestly, because if you see this, he's going to come in right here, try and get some damage. Why but is look he so at close? This. He shouldn't be that close, but let's see how fast he gets popped. Actually, he just gets, no, he doesn't really even have time to flash. He gets knocked up by the wreck side, too. So, not really an opportunity. Definitely should not have been positioned next to the Sand Soldiers, though. Goom taking nice advantage. Goom not even having to flash for that play. So just chaining those Azir abilities together very nicely. And this is a question we've had about Goon. Uh, can, how, he's very slow to develop new champions. Finally, we saw his Victor sort of kick into gear. And now we're seeing his, his Azir really get there. That was a nice mechanical play by, by an Azir. Very smoothly chained. Sure, Prey was in the wrong position, but Goon nailed it when it mattered. And look, champion mastery is something Goon has gotten with a certain amount of assassins. He might struggle to pick up the new champions, but with enough practice, and it's a long season, maybe it's playing into him as playoffs loom shortly. Okay, well, Najin here, they have a lot of wave clear, their ability to knock down these turrets Ooh. with the Sand Soldiers, and there's an equalizer. They're gonna just run through the tower right now. Prey gets roasted, forces that wild growth, but it's not enough to save him. OQ with the boomerang blade from the outside of the base wall will clean it up. Wisdom wants a flank. Wisdom, you cannot flank right now. And Najin powering forward. We've had three very fast games here, all sub 30 minutes. Najin looking to take another one right now. And there just isn't any kind of counterplay. Najin coming into this game and just dominating the laning phase. Just dominate, like you said. But look, Ku, three losing lanes and Evelyn versus Rek'Sai certainly made life difficult for themselves. It came to a point where, honestly, Najin had to make a big mistake for the momentum to start to, swift to switch to Ku. I mean, they tried to force objectives, but they don't really have the comp to do so. They've never hit the item timings on Cogmo, who's now 0-3-0 and a casual 55 CS behind the Siva. If we do see the golden, it is going to be mammoth for OQ. Yeah, it will be. I mean, still no Blade of the Ruined King even for this Cogma, so he is just absolutely shut down. And to Najin's credit, they realize that they've been targeting the Cogma in all the fights, and without that kind of advantage, like you were saying earlier about Prey's positioning, it's very strange because Prey's positioning was so excellent, perfect in think the of spring the, season. Think of the champions, Monty. Twitch, Cogma, position-based, very reliant champions, but suddenly it's really escaped for him in fits and spurts this season. Yeah, he was looking better for a while there, but this series certainly hasn't been his forte. And now we see as Najin starts to push onto this turret, what is going to come down here. 
Uh, still the Baron buff up, pushing those up, just falls off right now, but there's still no defense for it here too at the moment. There's just too much damage from Najin, and they still have all of that dive pressure. And Ku weren't even bluffing a contest. Both Lulu and Kogma were clearing the super minions in mid. Base broken very, very early against the Juggernaut. Bodes well for Najin. They can't break it a second time, but they have all the options. The playbook is completely open to Najin to do whatever they want. Yeah, it looks like they're going to change into the bottom side right now and have an Azir split push. Azir there with the Luden's Echo Poke going for that item early, and they just want to clean up the lanes right now, it looks like, and then recall to spend some of this mountain of money they have, they have acquired for themselves in the interim. It is obscene that Oku, with a pickaxe and an Infinity Edge, I mean, Static Ship Committee as well, might actually get to the Blade of the Ruin King before Prey, who shocked and only could afford a single dagger. Not even the uh, Stinger coming through. No, not at all. So, I mean, this Najin team, they can be surprising. And I'm, I'm curious where this goes for the rest of the season, because we've spent two seasons waiting for this very talented on paper roster Nod from Najin to get it together, to live up in terms of macro play to their micro prowess, to their ability to skirmish and win the laning phase. And honestly, they've done really well at snowballing their leads, and the vision control has been on point in this series. There's very little to complain about from Najin's perspective. I think of the things we've been calling out from Najin, vision control and Duke's ability to teleport. Those are two of the big macro problems that have plagued them all year. They've kept with the same lineup. They're trying to train those kind of macro uh, abilities that a top team needs to be able to be competitive into the lineup. And okay, this is only just one series, but if this is the Najin we will see in the remaining three series they have this season, even if they have to play against SKT and have the harder run in, there's no way that you can count out Najin from getting into the playoffs. Absolutely not, or even doing well in the playoffs too. And I think that's the scariest thing when you have guys like Duke and OQ on your roster, and even Goon, who was a top three mid in Korea when he was peaking about a year ago, uh, you, you have to be scared because at their best, this lineup is insanely talented. Talent's the one thing they always had. Arguably, they're keeping some very impressive talent on the bench, but young players, and who knows what the lineup will look like come next year. It's taken a long time for us to be convinced about Najan. And look, there's plenty of time for them to lose both this game and their momentum. Looks like they'll be able to get away here, but this is the, what Najin does to us analysts. They make us eternally hopeful that somehow they will get it together. So here we go. Coog is going to display some recalls. Nice ultimate, oh. but actually one of them gets away. That means Pure is not going to die. He has to flash. So cute attempt right there. Agony's embrace. OQ just had his recall triggered a, a microsecond earlier. He's out, said OQ, but... Pure doesn't die for it. They get a summoner, but when you're 12,000 gold and three dragons in the whole hell, seven dragons to, sorry, seven turrets to zero. Grim reading for Kuzi yeah. Tigers fans. And it's not too late either for Pure to get there in time. He's got Moby home guards, so easily able to slide into the dragon. For number four is coming up for Najin right here. This is our first game of the series to actually go over 30 minutes. Both of the first two were quite one-sided, and now Najin looking to dominate this dragon, although Ku trying to play for a turret here. Trying to break that first turret. They don't have any. That's standing gold across the map, but they can't hope to contest this dragon. Oh Fourth my. dragon, suddenly we're talking about 37 minutes and 20 seconds for that fifth dragon. And they're trying to bluff control around the Baron, but there's no fight that I can see, barring a massive mistake, the coup can take against Naja. Yeah, exactly, especially with, uh-oh, here we go. Prey trying to poke right now, but those Sand Soldiers and the Echo doing so much. Ooh. Oh, a huge equalizer onto the back line. Gorilla has to flash backwards immediately. Watch already there, he's gonna get some nice knockups. And there goes Gorilla OQ, going nuts from the flank. He has a Blade of the Ruined King. Spev has no armor. Spev is just going to melt in the face of OQ, and that is what he's going to do. Watch still skirmishing, but here comes the flank from Duke as he just destroys the back line, and there goes Prey. There's the ace. Najin doesn't care about the rest of this. Duke just going to waltz into the mid lane with his teleport, take the inhibitor, and then take the game. Death timer should be long enough 
But look at Smeb's items. He just had a, a Warden's Mail against this massive damage from Okyu. I mean, Okyu matched the Blade of the Ruin King with so much extra in the infantry, massively ahead of Prey. Najin, blown away in game one not an hour ago, have basically turned the world on its head. Oku watches on, and Najin start to gallop towards those playoffs. That was a very important win for Najin EM Fire. They take it here. They came in as the underdogs in that first game. We saw them had a very bad draft. There was a great answer from the Coot Tigers. They looked very prepared for what Najin was going to do. But when Najin started to mix it up, when they started pulling out the Olaf, things went the other way, and Coot Tigers it was close, but a lot of mechanical misplays in the early game gave Najin a huge edge. Yeah, let's remember that we were actually calling out this Najin Jard saying, okay, they need something special from the top lane. We see the perfect Juggermore coming in for Ku. The Rumble certainly wasn't that special something, but it, we are made believers of the fact that Najin played as a team around the Juggermore expertly. And Jug 